And so I think that the overall long-term demand is still up. Supply is mixed. Um, and you know, we've generally seen energy kind of diff- – oil prices and gasoline prices kind of bounced off their lows a couple times and headed up. I think uh, you know, my guess is that the lows are in. Maybe we test them again. But overall, I think there's more upside potential than downside potential. But then the second part of the investment thesis is that even if energy prices don't go up as quickly as I think they will in the years ahead, and they're on the, the more bear side of a kind of like sideways trend. A lot of those companies are cheaply priced even for current energy prices and have good balance sheets and spend most of their capital on returning it to shareholders. Um, so they kind of keep keep their current situation, but they're not aggressively trying to expand. And instead they, you know, they buy back shares, they pay dividends, they they improve their balance sheet, you know, they they decrease their net debt. Um, and so that's basically a positive carry outlook. Lynn Alden highlights the overlooked potential of the energy sector in the U.S. economy. While gold remains in focus, Alden points out the promising opportunities in energy investments. With increasing demand and constrained supply, coupled with the need for consistent energy sources and infrastructure development, Alden sees significant upside potential. Despite recent disinflationary trends, energy demand, particularly from data centers, remains crucial. Alden suggests that investments in oil, gas, and uranium offer attractive prospects compared to traditional alternatives. So I think that overall, we've got increasing demand for energy. Um, Supply is not terrible, but it's still relatively tight. Uh, Companies are not heavily incentivized to invest in new production. Um, And so um, I think that overall supply is going to be kind of relatively constrained. I think that um, shale oil is going to grow more slowly in the coming years than it did over the past decade, um, and that there's going to be there's going to be a price increase to bring in more capex to kind of bring in new supply and kind of incentivize that longer term development of these energy resources. I also think that um, you know over the past uh, over the past fifteen years the type of tech we've had has been relatively disinflationary. So for example, mobile devices, um, social media, these are not particularly energy intensive things. If anything, they they dematerialize a lot of the other things we have to use. Whereas outsourcing a lot of high computation thinking, so making making art, making videos, um, you know, making complex decisions, that's actually pretty energy intensive when, when we kind of put that into the tech sphere. Uh, it's more of a combined software and hardware situation. So I do think that we're going to see more energy demand out of things like data centers. Um, and then that's going to be challenging to meet. And then you need to do things like you need to increase the electrical grid capacity, which is ironically an energy intensive thing to do, uh, a materially intensive thing to do. Um, and so I think that the overall long-term demand is still up. Supply is mixed. Um, and you know we've generally seen energy kind of Oil prices and gasoline prices kind of bounced off their lows a couple times and headed up. I think you know my guess is that the lows are in. Maybe we retest them again, but overall, I think there's more upside potential than downside potential. But then the second part of the investment thesis is that even if energy prices don't go up as quickly as I think they will in the years ahead, and they're on the the more bear side of a kind of like sideways trend, a lot of those companies are cheaply priced even for current energy prices and have good balance sheets and spend most of their capital on returning it to shareholders. Um, so they kind of keep keep their current situation, but they're not aggressively trying to expand. And instead they, you know, they buy back shares, they pay dividends, they they improve their balance sheet, you know, they they decrease their net debt. Um, and so that's basically a positive carry outlook, which is to say that even in a middle of the road scenario, I think those investments are still attractive compared to things like T-bills, basically compared to um, you know mon- monetary alternatives. So I would say across the board, oil, gas, and, and uranium, um, basically. Um, I think that um, with those types of things, variable energy sources don't necessarily cut it. Uh, you need consistent energy sources, and you need an uh, an uptick in overall grid capacity, which uses a lot of materials and is built by machines using hydrocarbons. Um, and so, I, I think it's I think it's an all the above situation. I think we'll see we will see you know more solar and wind coming online, but I think it's those more um, 
uh, in control or base load types of energy sources that will also continue to be in demand. So I, I think across the board, higher energy across the board. Lynn Alden highlights Bitcoin mining's role in optimizing energy usage, leveraging surplus energy during low demand periods and throttling back during shortages. She emphasizes how Bitcoin mining utilizes stranded energy, contributing to grid stability. Alden anticipates Bitcoin's integration into energy infrastructure to continue enhancing efficiency. Additionally, she attributes the recent gold price breakout to fundamental factors, suggesting a longer-term trend. Well, so what what Bitcoin mining does is it soaks up stranded energy. So um, when we, you know, the supply of the grid is fluctuating, right? It's some, some, if it's solar and wind, it's obviously fluctuating based on on those conditions. If it's hydro, it's fluctuating based on on rain. Uh, if it's nuclear, it's always on. So either way, you have this kind of always on or or fluctuating supply of electricity. And then on the demand side, you also have fluctuating demand. So during the day, there's different cycles, um, and then during the seasons, there are different levels of temperature and things like that. And the problem is that grids have to be designed for like the hottest day. Of the year like when everybody has their air conditions on when everybody's using peak electricity they have to design for that day to hopefully not have brownouts which means they have to overbuild for every other day and so you have this kind of you have these kind of two sine waves of supply and demand for electricity and they're always dealing with like a potential mismatch and so sometimes they're shutting off energy sources sometimes they're you know they're, they're sometimes they're having brownouts it depends on the grid we're talking about and one thing that bitcoin mining is is it's a very flexible demand source so you know they you know when energy pricing is cheap they can be operating at full speed but then as soon as energy pricing gets expensive, either because some supply went offline or because there's been a surge in demand, they can throttle back their demand because they are in the, the most flexible position to do that. Obviously, if you're a hospital, you can't just you can't, you know, change electricity based on pricing. And even if you're even if you're doing something like you're a manufacturer or you're running an office, you know, you can't it's 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 much more disruptive to change your electricity consumption based on grid pricing or grid shortages compared to if you're a Bitcoin miner and you structure your contract to say, look, we're gonna get the lowest cost, but we're gonna be the first in line to turn off whenever there's a issue. And that, that's how they structure that or they sell it back to the grid. There's also things like you know the World Bank estimates um, you know, if you look at their estimates for how much natural gas is just flared into the atmosphere every year. Uh, it's something like an, an amount of energy that can power the Bitcoin network eight times over um, or or how much methane leaks out from landfills into the atmosphere, right? So basically there's just, there's a, a unfathomable amount of, of just stranded energy out there. And over time, Bitcoin kind of fills in those gaps. It takes a couple cycles to do so, but we've already been seeing it do that. And I think that trend is going to continue. I think it just becomes an embedded part of the grid and that anytime you have any sort of variable power or fluctuating demand relative to steady power, um, you're leaving money on the table if you're not if if you're you know if, if you're not using some of that to mine Bitcoin because if you're getting zero zero or negative cost, ne I mean negative revenue for your energy, then you're leaving money on the table. So I I think that because we're now in this kind of fiscal dominance regime, higher interest rates fuel the deficit even more, um, which which, which potentially fuels gold. Um, I think you know you could get liquidity like temporary liquidity shocks if for example um you run these big deficits the fed tries not to monetize them uh and you get kind of um like a, a temporary liquidity problem in treasury markets that could certainly contribute to a gold sell-off uh temporarily um but i do think the, the the breakout has legs to it um i think that the breakout is is real i think that it's it's based on fundamentals i think that there's a, a good reason that a lot of foreign investors want to own gold more so than treasuries um, and that they want to basically have a better ratio of gold to treasuries. Um, and I, I think that that's, that's probably going to be a longer term story. Uh, and I have no view on what gold does in say a three month period. Um, but I do think it, it's, it's now that it's broken out, I think that's a very strong sign that I think it's probably headed higher in the next few years. In today's discussion, we explored the dynamics of energy supply and demand, noting the increasing pressure on resources and the potential for constrained supply in the future. Lynn Alden highlighted the importance of consistent energy sources and the need for an uptick in grid capacity to meet growing demands. Additionally, we delved into the role of Bitcoin mining in optimizing energy usage and stabilizing grids, 
Finally, we touched on the recent breakout in gold prices and its underlying fundamentals. We appreciate you joining us for this insightful discussion. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel like this video and share your thoughts in the comments below.